Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. So I am reading in the book of Job. <clears throat> I'm not superstitious. However, I love when I'm reading in the book of Job and I begin to have difficulties in different areas of my life, whether it's sicknesses, which we've definitely been struggling with, um, whether it is um, with technological difficulties. And so there we're, I've already told you about the copier problem, so now we're starting to have problems with the <laughs> recorder in the back. Anyways, it's fun. So we may or may not have a slide presentation. You know you don't have sermon note sheets. Some of you are excited about that, I'm sure. But um, anyways, that was part of the copier problem. So You'll have to write your own sermon note sheets down as we go. Um, and normally, I really enjoy listening to Chuck read the passage that final time um, before I get to speak on it. And uh, so, I didn't have that pleasure. Um, so, I'm turning my passage now. But, Jesus, over the getting back into this book of Matthew, we have seen that he is um, a Jewish Messiah. That Matthew a Jewish man, is writing about to a Jewish audience. And that, um, as we've seen coming through all this, there have been a lot of Jewish, if you would, concepts that you need to fully understand. And so even um, as David and I both spoke um, the, over before Resurrection Day, um, about chapter 18 and then the end of 17, but primarily there in the beginning of 18, David had a great message on the, the worth of children. And again, the key in all that is the fact that to the Jewish mind, children were, were nothing. And as we're going to see today as well, in that Jewish mindset, women were chattel. Okay? They were property. And, um, and so Jesus is going to challenge them continually to change the way that they they think, to repent, change the way they think. And so as he's come through here, in the, we're seeing the beginning of the, the ministry, and we come now into this longer section of Matthew dealing with the instructions of Jesus, Jesus is continually challenging the people to change the way they, they think. They have been indoctrinated by the world. They've been indoctrinated by their, their religion and by their traditions. And so Jesus is coming and saying, look, You've heard it said, but this is part of back there in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, but I say unto you. And so he's going to continue to say that. Even in this portion of Scripture that we're going to look at today, he's going to give them, but I say unto you. Okay? He's going to give them the word, and he's going to come back, and he's going to speak authoritatively to the people. And this is important for you and I, because, again, you and I are meeting here today because of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, Messiah. And... We then proclaim or state that we are followers of Messiah. But Jesus basically told us that if we said we're followers of him, we would do what? Obey him. We do the things that he, he shared. John shares that in his epistle. How can you say you know him and you don't do his commands? Make sense? So as we go through this, I just again want to just challenge you. As we... As we go through these areas where Jesus is instructing the Jewish people, we need to really be paying attention. Because this is our Messiah, our Christ, our leader, our mentor, our deliverer, whatever term you want to put in there, that we're supposed to be following. One of the greatest challenges in our culture today is this area of marriage and divorce. Many times we like to call it the challenge of divorce and remarriage. But I think that's not the problem. The problem is what I just said before that. Marriage and divorce. If you handle the, the, the situation first with marriage and then discuss what the appropriate place of divorce is, then you never get to the problem of handling, worrying about divorce and remarriage. Does that make sense? So that kind of gives you a glimpse of where we're heading, right? So in this passage, where we start off with is this challenge, if you would, questioning by the, the Pharisees. 
Okay? Now, again, understand what's going on. We've talked about this a little bit, but the Pharisees aren't very excited about Jesus' entry into the world. He's starting to, to cause problems. He's starting to teach a new way. A way that is not stuck to their what? Their traditions. That's exactly right. Okay? And so they're getting a little bit frustrated here, and they have to make a decision. Do you remember? We talked about this a couple months ago. They had to make a decision. When they're faced with all the, the, the um, miracles that Jesus was doing, was he doing them by the authority of God? Was he who he was claiming to be, or wasn't he? You've got to make this decision. Because once you decide, once you declare that he is Messiah, then what? Then you've got to do what he says. That's exactly right. And I, again, I remember meeting with an individual for years on a Wednesday night. Um, because of their work schedule, they could only meet late at night. So we met from 9.30 at night till midnight. And this individual was so close to salvation, understood it fully. But they knew the minute they would give their life to Christ, not that they had to change, but that Christ would change them. And they liked their, their life. And so they didn't want to do that until God allowed everything to fall apart. And sadly, they made the decision too late. Not too late for salvation, but too late for the what? The consequences. So today, we're going to deal with the sanctity of marriage. And the first thing we're going to look at is this question um, by the Pharisees. Because it is very revealing um, in, to other situations. Okay, And so we see the first of all that the Pharisees came to Jesus, also came to him, to Jesus, testing him and saying to him. And so the reason for their questions, right off the bat, we're told. Why did, why did they come to ask Jesus this question? Well, the Greek word is periazontes, okay? It means troubling, tempting, testing. This is that word we talk about a lot, periasmos, okay? That is like the, the, the coin, heads and tails, okay? It means troubling. In James chapter 1, um, it says, Count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into to many kinds of trials. Trials. Okay? But then later in verse 12, I think it's 12 or verse 14, where it says, Blessed is the man who endureth temptations. It's the exact same word. Trial, temptation, exact same word. Periosmos. Okay? It's a troublesome situation, but what it is to you is determined by how you respond to it. And so this troublesome situation comes upon you, and you fall. You sin. It was a what? It was a temptation. This troublesome situation comes upon you, and you rise to the occasion. You respond with the mind of Christ. It was a trial. So the trying of your faith worketh patience. The tempting of your faith bringeth dross. But sin, it reveals the dross in you. Make sense? Both have the same effect. The whole idea is to cause you to what? To grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Think about it. How do you grow in grace? How much grace did you ever receive? All of it. it. So how do you grow in it? You grow in the grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The more you come to know Jesus, the more you recognize His holiness. The more you recognize His holiness, the more you recognize what? Your uckiness. Your sinfulness. And the more you recognize your uckiness and your sinfulness, the more you recognize His holiness, the more you recognize that He is a God of grace. And you begin to appreciate His grace more and more in your life. These guys didn't get that. And so they're coming to test Jesus, but their goal in testing Jesus is that Jesus would what? Sin. They had messed up. He'd stumble, he'd fall. That they would have a way to accuse him. And so their words are extremely important, okay? So first, we have the reason for their questions. But in it, in this statement, we're going to see the reasoning of their questions. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife 
for just any reason. Now, lawful is, it's an okay translation, but it's not the best. The word is ex estin, okay? And you say, okay, that's a big deal, okay? But it, it's two words that are put together in the Greek. Ek, okay, means out of or from. But extin, estin, is just a to be verb. Amy, I am. Amy, estin, okay? And so you are. And so it just means out of existence. You say, well, how does this play out? Okay? And so the idea is, that it's not something that's of the law. There is a word that talks about nomos is law, okay? So that's coming from the law. This just means that can it happen? Can it, can it be? Is it permissible? Not, they're not asking, what does the law say about this? But what they're asking is, can I get away with this? Is it permissible? Can you get away with divorcing or putting away your wife for just any reason. Now, before we get to the any reason part of it, I want to look at this. this you can look up these Matthew 12, 2, 4, and that kind of stuff for the permissibleness of this, okay, the lawful side of it. But 1 Corinthians 6, 12, and 10, 23 are passages that we know, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. It's just a free aside here. And that is, all things are lawful unto me. It's that word, though. All things are permissible. But I will not be brought under the mastery of anything. All things are lawful or permissible unto me, but not all things are beneficial. Then in chapter 10, all things are lawful unto me, but not all things are, are of good. All things are lawful unto me, but not all things edify. Should I continue to sin that what? Grace may abound? What's Paul's response? God forbid. May it attain. May it never be so. No way! I mean, that's what we would say today. No way! And yet, I really believe this is... What the Pharisees are doing is exactly what we in the church do. I don't want to know what God's will is. I don't want to know what God's best is. I just want to know what I can get away with and be still okay with. How close to the world can I become... And get away with it. At what point is the other shoe going to drop? When will judgment actually occur? So as we've been going through Jeremiah and Ezekiel, I think that's what's playing out with Israel. They keep pushing the envelope. Because God doesn't do anything at that very moment. He just says, I don't like that. That's not good. I'm going to judge. Don't do that. I want you to do right. And I'm not making fun of God at that point. Make sense? But God is long-suffering, not willing that what? And he should perish. But what do we do with the long-suffering and grace of God? We abuse it. We trample it. That's why David says in, his, in Psalm, 100, in, not, not 100, Psalm 18, at the very end, we know Psalm 18 because it declares the, um, the revelation of God um, both in nature and in his word. But at the very end of it, David says, and keep me from presumptuous sins. Man, that is me. Do you know what a presumptuous sin is? It's you quoting 1 John 1, 9 while you're doing it. But God is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If you what? If you confess it. So you know it and you can quote it. So therefore you sin so grace can abound so you can turn around and say, God, I'm confessing my sin. Now you have to be faithful and just to forgive me my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness because your word says so. Years ago, and you may have heard this, um, me give this illustration, so I, I shared with somebody earlier this week that I know um, as you get older, you begin to share the same anecdotes over and over again, so please apologize. I apologize ahead of time if, I, if you've heard this thing before or even a hundred times before. Um, some of you may not have heard it, and that just justify giving the antidote. Um, and that is, um, years ago, during the, the L.A. riots, there was the, um, the guy who was the... Um, assistant chief of police my mind is blanking on his name right now and i heard this on a um, a focus on the family he was being interviewed by james dobson and um anyways he um attended john MacArthur's church he was a a strong believer and his his son came home one day from school and he said dad i i figured out the problem with 
with Christianity. He says, wow, son, this is great. We've been struggling with this for hundreds, if not thousands of years now. He says, what's your take on it? He said, well, you know, Dad, he says, the, the, um, the, the, you know, the, kind of like the world is here, and Christians are seeking to maintain this separation, you know? And his dad says, well, yeah, so what's the problem, you know? He said, well, the problem is that, that the world is on a downward slope. And we're just kind of keeping our, maintaining our separation from the world. But God's holiness never changed. So as we're keeping our eyes on the world and trying to keep this 40-year, you know, conservatism thing going on, as, you know, we'll sing the songs from 40 years ago, you know, because then they're, they're, they're old and all this kind of stuff. And so as long as we are seeking to be a little bit more conservative than the world, we think we're doing okay. We're all along, we're falling fall farther and further away from God. We're wanting to know exactly what these guys are asking. Is it permissible? Well, how, what's permissible? Not what does your word say. I don't care what the word says. I don't care what the law says. I don't know. I don't care what God, God's perfect will is. I'm not saying that's me. But that's kind of how we act sometimes. I just want to know, can I get away with this? And I'm not going to go into all the things that I think that we struggle with. I just want to put it out there. I want you to ask yourself, is this you? As I like to put myself in each position, am I this Pharisee? And he says, is it permissible for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Literally, the word is cause that's there. And um, it is the same word. It's, it's talking about an accusation. It's a judicial kind of concept, okay? That in John 18 and John 19 is all about Jesus. When Jesus is before Pilate, and Pilate two or three times takes, he goes out before the, um, the people and says, look, this guy's innocent. I find no cause. Cause for what? Condemnation. I find no cause in him. And yet, he still what? Hands him over to be crucified. And when they crucify him, above him on the cross, on the titulus, they put the, this um, accusation above him. Same exact word. They put the cause. King of the Jews. And so the Pharisees didn't like that. They wanted that accusation. They wanted that cause to be changed. What did they want the cause to be changed to? He claimed to be. He said, I am the king of the Jews. But, interestingly enough, the ruler of the land put what? He was the king of the Jews. But that's the word. That's, so, is it permissible? Is it permissible for a man to put away his wife for any cause. How many of you have seen Fitter and Roof? Right? Okay? Oh, some of you. Just some of you. So they, they go into the synagogue, and this one scene, they started off in the synagogue with a, the with a rabbi teaching. And he's reading from the, the, not the Torah, but rather from the writings of the, the, um, the rabbis. And, and he says, Therefore, a man can put away his wife even for burning the toast. Even for burning the toast. But this, we laugh. But this is it. Can a man, is it permissible for a man to put his wife for any semi-valid reason? It doesn't matter whether it's a just cause. It doesn't matter whether it's a, it's, as long as in my brain it's a what? It's a valid accusation. For me, eating toast in the morning is extremely important. And I like my toast browned, but not blackened. And so she knows that. And she continually blackens my toast. I learned to like blackened You learned to like blackened toast. We're not going to talk about individual relationships today. Okay? And so, literally, Marcia doesn't make my toast. I make my own toast, okay? But, but think about it. That's, what, the app, that's the, what we're bringing out here is, is that at that point, it becomes a what? A just cause. Because she's blackening my toast, and she knows not to blacken my toast. Therefore, according to the rabbinic tradition, derived from the law, and we're going to talk about this in a moment because Jesus is going to answer this, I can put her away at my whim. And I ask myself, do I do this with the word of God? 
Do I play spiritual gymnastics? Do I play theological contusions and, and twist, uh, twisting things around and confusions so that I can get the Word of God to say what I want it to say, and therefore I can justify myself? The sad thing with that is, even if I can justify myself, what's going to happen one day? I'm going to die. I'm going to stand before the true judge. And it doesn't matter how I justified myself. Because in the end, the guy who wrote the Constitution, if you would, is going to say, that's not what I wrote. And you can deceive yourself, James chapter 1, but ultimately you're not going to deceive God, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man soweth, that also shall he reap. Galatians chapter 6. So, is it permissible? Well, if that's the case, and we're going to talk about Jesus' response, but this is their, their retort, this is their comeback. Why did Moses command, why did Moses command us to put away our wives? Think about that. Did Moses command them to put away their wives? Did Moses tell them, you better put away your wives if they burn the toast? Now, I know he didn't say burn toast, but you get what I'm saying? So they are immediately coming and they're doing what? They're twisting. Does this sound familiar? Where, where does it remind you, Karen? Three, thank you, there you go. I think six, well, yeah, they, were, they were really evil and wicked there, but yeah. Genesis 3, this is Satan. This is exactly what Satan did. Did God say, and, he, and so he begins to twist God's word just a little bit, just a little bit. Is it permissible? Then why did God command? And you start to do what? Oh, huh, hmm. If you don't know what? The word of God. If you do not know the Word of God, then it is, you are susceptible to the deceiver to come in and twist God's Word. The battle always goes based upon God's Word. That's the importance of it. When Jesus was, was being tempted, if you would, troubled by, by Satan in the wilderness, how did, what did Satan do? Doesn't it say in God's Word? And how did Jesus respond? But it also says in God's Word. And so they both got the sword out and they're fencing with the Word of God. But if you don't know the Word of God, that double-edged sword, Satan loves to use it to bring people down with this very Word. you got to know the Word. I, I, there's a song by um, Buddy Green Davis. Buddy Davis. you got to know... This, the, oh, I'm going to mess this up. you got to know the Bible like the lawyer knows the law. I love it. you got to know the Bible like the lawyer knows the law. Because that's exactly what people love to play with you. So, Messiah's response. He's going to get into the God's purpose for the permanence of marriage. So, starting here in verse 4 to 6, we read, And Jesus answered, so this is the first question, Is it permissible for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? Jesus answered and said, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother, shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh? So then... They are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. So, what was Jesus' initial response? He takes them back to the Word of God, looking at the institution of marriage. The first thing he does is he establishes the authority of God's Word. Have you not read? What's the idea? You know you have. So, what's the debate? I love the shirt that we got, you know, about creation. What's the debate? I mean, I, I, I fought till I was blue in the face. Someone took me to Genesis 1. We went through Genesis 1. I fought till I was blue in the face, but I knew I lost. Because the real decision for me had to be what? It wasn't whether it's was creation or evolution. That wasn't the debate. What was the debate? Whether I believe God's word. I either believe God's telling me the truth or I don't believe it. That's really the debate. There is no debate on creation. It's truth. I mean, you could say there's no gravity all you want. 
but there's still gravity. Does it make sense? It doesn't matter whether you believe it or you don't believe it. There is no debate. What the debate really is, will you submit to God's word or not? And so Jesus takes these guys back to God's word, all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to the intent of God's creation, that God took two. God took two. Remember? God created Adam, breathed into him breath of life, put him in a garden. Everything's good. But God decides that it's not good for man to be alone. And so before God ever made Adam, or before God ever made Eve, what did he do? He brought all the animals before Adam, so Adam could name them. But every single one of those animals had a what? Had a mate. Had a mate. There was a male and there was a female. And so as he comes through, it's to bring an awareness to Adam that Adam what? He didn't have a mate. He was alone. And so God made Adam a helpmeet. God puts Adam asleep from his side, whether it's the rib or a side, Hebrew, it's the word side. He takes the side from Adam, and he makes Eve, and then he, he wakes him up out of the uh, recovery room, or however that plays out, right? He wakes Adam up, and he brings Eve to him. And Adam's excited. This is my bone of my bone. This is flesh in my flesh. And Jesus says, as a result of that, therefore, what God has put together, let not man put asunder. You guys are asking the wrong questions. You want to know why can't I, but I want to know why should you. Why can't I do this? Well, let me ask the question, why should you? How does this reveal the holiness of God? How does this, how does this reflect the love of God to the world? How does this help you? In Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll look at this in a moment, probably, we won't have time, but refer to it anyway. We're told in Ephesians chapter 5 that, that wives ought to submit to their husbands as unto the Lord. Husbands ought to love their wives, even as Christ also loved the church. The reality is that the husband and the wife, they form the picture that was created all the way back in creation of Christ in the church. I'm supposed to be Jesus. Marsh is supposed to be the church. We're supposed to reflect that to the world. So, how do my decisions, how does my use of liberty, if you would, permissibility, however you want to state that, how does that helping me doing what God wants me to do in this world? I'm supposed to be like a city that is set upon a hill whose light cannot be hid. How is my decision helping that? Or is it all about me? So instead of asking the question, why can't I? Ask yourself the question, why should you? Why should I? What does this do to the kingdom for the kingdom of God? If there's no benefit to it, then why should you? When it comes to struggles with your spouse, because this is specifically the topic, and every time I come to marital counseling situations... Okay, I get very frustrated. I, I'm not very good at a, as a shepherd. Okay, I'm just honest. I, I, I don't mind doing marital counseling, but I'd rather see marital counseling as discipleship. I'm a teacher. I'm a discipler. I love that. I don't like wiping noses. Especially when I don't feel like they should be what? Running. Okay? My first and foremost statement whenever I come into a marital counseling situation is I do not believe in an innocent partner. I do not. I do not believe in an innocent partner. You have got to come into the counseling situation acknowledging the fact that you are the problem in your marriage. And nobody wants to do that. In fact, that's why we're in counseling, because everybody wants to acknowledge the fact that what? The other person's a problem in the marriage. But Jesus is very clear. You got to worry about the beam in your own eye before you have to worry about the speck. But no, it ain't a speck. I'm telling you, baby, that's a log. You ain't seen the log like I've seen the log. Then Jesus is a liar. Again, it's going to come back down to not so much creation, evolution, this, that, divorce, remarriage, all that kind of stuff. It really comes back down to what? The Word of God. Do I believe the Word of God? 
Do I believe it? Am I reading it? Am I applying it? I mean, really, it all comes down to it. I know I'm very simplistic in my thoughts sometimes. But this is what God has taught me. Everything, all my problems in my life come down to this one thing. Am I really being a disciple of Jesus or not? Am I applying his word or not? Am I wanting to be like the world or am I wanting to be like Jesus? I mean, it just all boils down to it. I am called to love my wife like Christ loved the church. Who can do that? So why try? Do we not think that way sometimes, guys? If I only had a better model, I think God made a mistake when he joined me with her. Because that's where we're going to get the disciples at the very end. If such is the way with marriage, it's better for us not to get married at all. Jesus said, look, you go back to God's word. That woman, she was a gift from God. Proverbs says that, doesn't it? He who finds a wife, finds a good thing, in favor of the Lord. You don't understand, mine's like the dripping faucet. I'd rather live in the middle of the wilderness That's not the mind of Christ. Aren't you glad Jesus loved you? I'm talking to the guys. Loved you even when you were unlovable. You know, he doesn't give us an out. He doesn't say, love your wives when they honor and respect you. He says, love your wives like Christ loved the church. In women, he doesn't give you an out. He doesn't say, honor and respect your husband when he's loving you. He could be the biggest jerk. And you're still called upon to what? Honor and respect him. The institution of marriage, he goes back to. Oh, here we go. I told you, I'm in the middle of the, we're going to, this is how it's going to play out. Can you go back and hit my left button for me? Isn't that funny? So he points them with the institution of marriage. Secondly, he's going to talk about, now in verses 7 to 9, the disillusion of marriage. 7 to 9. It says, They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. So they asked the question, why did Moses command? So I want to go back to this concept because of the allowance of, of divorce okay, that we read about here. Thank you. Hit the next hit the button again. The first thing he says is, because of the hardness of your heart. Moses didn't command it, but he allowed for it. It was an allowance. Okay, Remember terminology here. It wasn't a command. It was an allowance because of the hardness of your heart. So go, turn with me to Deuteronomy 24, verse 1 to 4. I think I have it up here. So, Andrew, hit the button. I do. Okay? So you can look at it in yours, or it's up here. Okay? Deuteronomy 24, verse 1 to 4, we read, When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes, because he has found some uncleanness. Key word here, right? Because can we what? Put away our wives just for any reason, any cause. Cause. Okay? So it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness, I'll come back to that word, in her. And he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. When she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her as his wife, then her former husband, who divorced her, must not take her back to be his wife. And af- after she has been defiled, um, for that is an abomination before Yahweh. And you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Okay? Did I, I read further than what you got there, right? No. Oh, oh did you, did you, you, you switched it. Go back, hit the right button, buddy. Here you go. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, right there is what we want. Okay, so, um, so a man takes a mar- wife, he marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he found some uncleanness. Note the Hebrew word, literally is erva, okay, and it means nudity or nakedness, okay? Now, I got, 
All these verses, you don't have to throw note sheets anyway, but I didn't put them on there. But Genesis 9, 22 to 23, that's the part with Noah, or Noah, I'm, yeah, Noah. After the, um, after the ark lands, and he makes himself some wine, and he gets drunk, and then Ham comes in and, you know, makes fun of his father and his nudity, his nakedness, okay? Um, you could go to Exodus 20, verse 26, Exodus 28, verse 42, Leviticus 18, verses 6 to 19, it occurs here 24 times, Leviticus 20, um, 11, verses 17 to 21, occurs there eight times. If you want those, I'll give them to you later, okay? But the idea is that this word literally means nudity or nakedness, okay? It's not this word that just means a generic uckiness. He's not saying when a man, she finds no favor in his eyes because, I think this is just dead, because he's found some uckiness in her. Make sense? That's, but you, can you see how the, the, the um, Phariseeism, the, the, the rabbinic thing starts to happen? One rabbi says what? He takes this and says, well, it just means this. And then the next one takes what he says. Did you ever play Whisper Down the Lane? Did you guys ever, when I was in high school, when I was in um, my social studies class, um, I didn't much into it. And uh, so don't do this, especially your home scores, right? You really get in trouble for this. Um, anyways, we would put three, three lines on our, our um, three columns on our lined paper, and you start with like red, white, and blue, you know, like the American flag, right? And um, do you bring batteries? Okay. Um, red, white, and blue. And so under red, you may think blood. Under white, you think purity. Under blue, you might think water. And then you hand, so that, so you to give it to the next person, and they, they see blood, and they, they're going to put down whatever, you know, type. And da 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 da. Anyways, and you just keep passing it around to the, the, the kids that, that are doing this thing, right? And by the end of the class, you've got the front and the back all covered. And it's always kind of fun to see where you ended up from where you started. You started with red, white, and blue, and you may wind up with something just totally weird, you know? It means nothing at all. That's exactly what happens here with rabbinic law, okay? That they, um, well, this means this and this means that. And before we pick on them, how often do you read commentaries and trust commentaries above the Word of God? Because that's exactly what happens. And then we have commentaries being written off of commentaries. Well, I mean, and I've heard people preach this. They will quote numerous commentators and then commentate off the commentaries. That's the exact same thing. Rather than going back to what God's Word says. So, what does you read it? Okay. And using, going back to the Hebrew, what was the qualification for what Moses gave, quote, unquote, as a command, which really wasn't a command, was a, permis- a permission. What was, the, what was the reason, the only reason, to be handing, to putting away your wife? They found what? Some form of, don't say uncleanness. What does the word really mean? Everywhere else, it means nakedness or nudity. Okay? She's exposed herself somehow. I, I know it's pretty, pretty blunt, but that's exactly what's happening, okay? So you say, well, how does that happen? Okay, so we come down here. She's been defiled. We have the word tame, unclean, defile, as opposed to tahor, which means clean in Leviticus 10. We're going to go to another passage in just a moment, okay? For that is an abomination before Yahweh. So this stuff that's happening here, this uncleanness, this nudity, nakedness thing, is something that's going to defile her and it's going to be an abomination before Yahweh. Okay? Thank you, Andrew, very much. Okay? Leviticus 18, verse 22 to 30, okay, we read, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination, that's our word, okay? Nor shall you mate with an animal to defile, that's the same word from the previous thing, okay, yourself with it, nor shall any woman stand before an animal to mate with it, it is a perversion. Do not defile yourself with any of these, for by all these the nations are defiled, which I am casting out before you. For the land is defiled. Therefore I visit the punishment of its iniquity upon it, and the land vomits out its inhabitants. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and not, shall not commit any of these abominations, either any of your own nation or any stranger who dwells with you. For all these abominations the men of the land have done who were here before you, and thus the land is defiled, lest the land vomit you out when you are defiled in it. 
as it vomited out the nations that were before you. For whoever commits any of these abominations, the persons who commit them shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore, you shall keep my ordinance so that you do not commit any of these abominable customs which were committed before you, and that you do not defile yourselves by them. I am the Lord. So, going backwards here. No, I want to go that way. There we go. So we're going backwards. This defilement as being opposed to be holy and clean, okay? So this is being something that's not good in the eyes of God because it's a what? It's an abomination. All these things, if you come before them, what do they all have in common? They're abominations. What do they have in common beyond the fact that they're all abominations? We know that. That's being stated here. They're sexual immoralities. There's exposing of oneself in some immoral manner. Okay? So, I'm thinking that this whole concept, bringing the law together, of what's happening here, is that God's saying is exactly what Jesus says in Matthew 19. Okay? It's the adultery of your spouse, if you would. Okay? Because he comes there and says then, in verse 9, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for what? Sexual immorality. Literally, the word there is pornea. Okay? Which is where we get our word pornography. Pornos, graphos. Graphos is the writings or the pictures of, and porne, of evil, of wickedness. Literally, it's evil wickedness, but the word is used many times of sexual immorality. Okay? Fornication is a word that's used a lot of times. And so the reality is that, that you're not supposed, unless it is for sexual morality. Now, that brings us into this problem today. Because back then, when Jesus is talking these things, for someone to commit this, it was a what? A physical act. Okay? Until Jesus in Matthew Matthew 5 says what? You heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you have committed adultery. And I promise you, this is so interesting to me, just in the last 20 years, I've had people wanting to divorce their spouse... For lusting after a picture, okay, I, I, I'm not downplaying pornography at all, okay? It's evil, it's wickedness. The word means evil. But then, to go one step further, because they know that the husband or the wife, whatever, has lusted in their hearts, and Jesus said it was one and the same. So I want to ask you, You don't need to put up your hands for this one. How many of you, your wife, your husband, would be justified in asking for a divorce because you have lusted after somebody else in your heart? It doesn't mean, doesn't nearly, physically, sexually, that's usually the guy, but it could be relationally, that's the woman. Women lust relationally after other men. That's why the, the, the Christian Harlequin romance novels are, are big sellers. Okay? They don't have all the, the, the sexual stuff in it. They have the romance, the, the relational stuff in it. And that I wish I had a... Uh, and so we love watching When Calls the Heart. And so I wish I had a, a Mountie Jack in my life, you know, or whatever. And, you know, I, I, boy, I wish that my husband was so much like uh, Colt, Lee Coulter. Or, you know, and, 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 and so... It's, I'm getting some laughter, so some of you know these names, okay? And so you pick whatever movie you want it to be. You can pick whatever book you want it to be. But we tend to do this. Just Ladies do that just like guys. That, oh, I wish my wife was a dumb blonde sometimes. No, I really don't, but sometimes I do, you know? I mean, I, you know, I wish she just doted over me. Ah, honey, you're the best thing ever. You know, even if I'm not, I'm, and, you know, that, and, and we begin to do this lusting thing. And, and look, it goes all the way back up. Is it what? permissible for me to get rid of my spouse for any what? For any cause. Rather than looking at what God had determined from the beginning. And that was what? Well, not two shall be one flesh. And what God has put together, let not man put asunder. And so Jesus gives a reason here because of sexual morality, because of the breaking of the bonds. But still the whole point is that beyond all things, what should be the desire? 
reconciliation, yes, but that's a step toward keeping the oneness. Keeping the oneness. I rejoice in the Lord. I'm not going into the details for my wife. I mean, clearly, Arsh and I didn't get married for the right reasons. We weren't believers. And I ran my wife through the ringer in my marriage. And she has every reason to have gotten rid of me. And she never did. And I rejoice in the Lord for it. I mean, I don't say that pridefully. I'm an idiot. But God in his grace allowed my wife to do that love test stuff. Now she didn't really do the book. It was before the book was ever written. If you are committed to Jesus Christ, then you are committed to your spouse. I mean, I've said it. People say, that's not very romantic. Whatever. I will never divorce my wife because of my relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you get it? Because of my knowledge of God. It goes back down to it. For me to leave my wife is really to divorce my God. She's not my God, but you get what I'm saying. I understand that where all this plays out. And again, it goes back to the creation evolution thing. It's not about creation. There's no debate. Why? Because I had to make a decision. Do I believe in God? Do I believe what God says? If D, the D word comes into my, my marriage, that's because of my faith in my God is waning. Are we tracking? The consequence of divorce is huge. It brings adultery into the situations. Jesus said anybody who marries somebody who's been put away does what? Commits adultery. Now, I understand some of you may be in this situation, okay? I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. I'm not going to hide from it. I'm not going to not preach something because I'm worried that someone here may be offended. What's done is what? It's done. Okay? If it was sin, if you, if, if you are in a marriage that was a result of sin, God doesn't tell you to, to, to stop the marriage. He doesn't. But what should you do? Acknowledge that it was. Lord, there were sinful decisions that brought this together, but I rejoice in you that we are here. And from this moment, I am going to love her like Christ of the church. And, and she says, I am going to submit to him. Oh, as hard as that's going to be. I'm going to submit to him as the church is supposed to submit to Christ. And you are going to be that reflection of God and of his grace where he gives seconds and thirds and fourth chances. But if you already are married right now, period, what's the decision? I will never, ever have the D word coming in my life. Because I will reflect Jesus Christ in this relationship that he has me in right now. So at the very end, the seriousness of marriage. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but this is where the, the, the disciples come back and said, well, this is the way it is. It's better not to even be married. Have you ever thought of that sometimes? I wish I was never married. Okay, we all say that in our, in our brain, but we come back and say what? We know that's not what we really think. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's not. It's not. Okay? And so, but Jesus, Jesus treats the statement seriously. He doesn't let it go. Look at Jesus' response. He says, this is hard saying. I get it. I get what I'm saying to you is a hard saying. All cannot accept this saying, verse 11, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs. Eunuchs? Whoa, we're up in the game. I mean, you know what a eunuch is, right? For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. Well, gee, Paul... Paul grabs a hold of this, and he talks about it in 1 Corinthians 7, and we're not going to go there, but Paul basically says, look, there is a primary reason to get married. It's the opposite of eunuchism. Because of the burning of the flesh. And not everybody has that gift. In fact, what he says is, it's a what? It's a very rare gift. And he says in chapter 7 later, not in these verses that I have up here, but later he says it's better for you to be single because if you're single, then you're not going to be distracted by the things of the world and how you can please your spouse. So you can want to serve the Lord. But the minute you get married, you become distracted because you want to please your spouse. He said, but the reality is, 
If you cannot not burn, if you cannot be a eunuch for the kingdom of God's sake, then it's better to what? Get, bar- get married. And the reality then is, and I don't want to spend the time on this, I don't have the time, we're past time, but this goes back into the pornea stuff, the, the fornication stuff. A lot of fornication begins in the marriages because the spouses are not rendering under their spouse the, 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 the benefit, 1 Corinthians 7, go read it, that is commanded, commanded to be given. There's a reason, a primary reason to be married, and it's for sexual reasons. And when that isn't given, then it causes the spouse, whichever spouse that it is, to look away, to look elsewhere. And then when they look elsewhere, the, the hurt spouse, who's been withholding what they should have been withholding, wants to cry foul. It doesn't happen that way. There is no discerner with God. Just remember, if you are withholding and causing your spouse to be the eunuch, whether male or female, then you are the reason if they go astray. Now, they don't have a reason. They understand they still give an account before God. But you cannot say, and I, I get this in counseling all the time. It's just struggle. I struggle with this. You can't say, well, because so-and-so, because so-and-so. It doesn't matter. This is what your job is. And if you're not fulfilling what God has called you to do, you are going to account to God. But we want to go back to the Pharisees' first question. Is it what? Is it permissible? What can I get away with? It's not my fault. They have a cause. There was a reason. He's not loving me. Therefore, I don't have to honor him. She's not honoring and respecting me. Therefore, I don't have to love her. No, it's not the case at all. What God has put together, let not man or woman put asunder. So in the end, what is your view of marriage? Have you been tainted by the world? I think we have been. I mean, we we watch these shows and, 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 and they taint what we think of love. They taint what we think about relationships. We read books. We see people. Sadly, we see people even in the church. Are you committed to your spouse as unto the Lord? Do you consider you and your spouse as one flesh, one entity? I wish I could tell you that Marsh and I are there. We're working on it. We're continually working on it. It's a work in progress. been a work in progress for 30-something years. And I can tell you that probably the major problem with it is me. Now, I hope when you talk to her, she'd probably tell you the major problem is her. But she might say it was me. Anyways, but she'd probably be right. Anyways. But it's, it's, it's something that, I, I mean, I am so self-centered and selfish and, and egotistical and all this kind of stuff. And for me to open myself up and to be one with her, is just, it's, just it's, a, it's a work in progress. But I know that that is God's plan. That's his purpose. Do you get it? And I'm not going to shy away from that I'm, prob- I'm a problem with that. Is there a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? And I... I Honestly, my prayer is that everyone here says, yes, yes, because my marriage isn't exactly what it needs to be before God. Therefore, I clearly have something that needs to change. And if you don't know what it is right now, ask God. Not ask God what's wrong with your spouse. Ask God what's wrong with you. What do you need to change in your relationship? Father, thank you for you. Thank you for the gift of marriage. You alone are the most high. There is no other God. And when you created us, you created us from the beginning with this this concept, Lord, where we could reflect you and the church to the world. Lord, I, I, I do not deserve your goodness. I am so grateful for my wife, Lord. Lord, I, I, I complain about her at times for sure, and I whine. But God, I am so thankful for her. She is the perfect woman for me. And God, I ask that you would help me to love her more and more like Christ loved the church. That she, Lord, would be able to love me because of my love for her as we love you because of your love for us. 
And I pray the same for every man that's here, Lord, that, that those who are married, Lord, that they would love their wives. And Lord, for those who aren't married, that you would, if it's your will, that you would lead a woman into their lives. But Lord, that in doing so, that they would understand that they need to love them and make them the priority that you have done with us. And for the women, Lord, that they would be committed to honoring you and respecting and honoring their husbands. Oh, Lord, you've said this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church, this oneness. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And this is speaking of Christ and the church, and this is a marvelous mystery to me. So I ask that you'd help me, help Marcia, to grow in our oneness that you want between Christ and the church, that we would be one as you are one. And for every relationship that's here, Lord, for those relationships, Lord, that are here, every one of us have things that we need to work on for sure. That you would convict us individually of what we need to, to work on to be more Christ-like in Christ's name. Amen.